Greetings. Um, I'm Brian Lecander, EIR Program Officer, and I'm pleased to welcome you this afternoon to this session entitled Expanding Visibility, Stakeholder Engagement, and Dissemination Marketing. Uh, I'm very keen to uh, see what our, our, our team of presenters and facilitators have in store for you today. Um, as you know, a key to success in EIR is not just developing and testing your model, but growing your project or preparing to grow your project uh, in new settings. So it's necessary, I think, to start improving your vis visibility even during an early phase grant. Um, first, perhaps to um, recruit participants, uh, but then later um, uh, to make uh, uh, the larger public aware of your project uh, with an aim um, to um, gaining sustainability and even preparing for uh, replication efforts. Um, um, so uh, as you may have heard in the opening session the other day, we at EIR are very um, um, uh, committed to learning about what you're doing in dissemination. And so we're going to be uh, hosting a series of, of quarterly calls with all of you project directors over the next several months to learn about your dissemination and visibility enhancing efforts. Um, today though, um, we're going to hear from um, Tom DeWire who has become something of a sustainability and scaling dissemination guru for the EIR technical assistance efforts. Um, Tom is the founder of EdScale, a consulting company that helps states, districts, and um, other education organizations do strategic planning and provide support for project implementation, capacity building, and performance management. Tom previously worked for EDI, the Education Delivery Institute, where among other things, he worked um, on a previous uh, contract uh, that the I3 program, EIR's predecessor, had to uh, help train grantees on sustainability and scaling issues. Um, so he's re uh, reprising that role with us, uh, with, with EIR now. Tom has also served in the past the Baltimore Public Schools and in the Baltimore City Mayor's Office on school improvement issues. Under the current EIR TA contract, Tom's been instrumental in leading a series of training workshops on sustainability, scaling, and dissemination. Um, we're at work uh, on a total of six total training webinars, virtual, virtually delivered. Three of them have already occurred, and you can find them on the EIR grantee resource library. Uh, when I get done here, I'm going to put the link for that in the chat, so you can watch those if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, we've got a fourth one that's scheduled November 15th. Um, and uh, there'll be two others coming down the road. Tom's also playing a leading role in the sustainability and scaling COP. Uh, and behind the scenes, he's thinking about planning an in-person workshop, which we hope to do in February of the coming year. Um, so there's a lot of great opportunities to address this issue. Um, and um, we're looking forward to uh, to what Tom and his team of, of other facilitators has got in store for us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's the, the best and longest intro I've ever had. So I appreciate it. <laughs> so now, now, I'm, now I'm fully embarrassed. Uh, no. um, so I'm excited, we're gonna dive in today. We've got, uh, as Brian mentioned, quite a few uh, contributors um, and, uh, Consider this a teaser uh, for it, or it's designed as, but also consider it a teaser for the longer workshop coming up in November. And we'll have more information about that at the end. So if we can go to the next slide. Please, Tammy. All right, so um, joining me are Helen Foster from Anlar. You can see Helen there, yep. Hey, Helen, and then Namrata Patel, who uh, is the, VP of Marketing and Communications at Leadership for Educational Equity, um, and is uh, also an author who has more than 16,000 five-star reviews on Amazon. Uh, ask her about that later, and has a second book coming out shortly. So anyway, she's a woman of many talents, and are excited to hear from her today 
um, around uh, communications and marketing um, and her experience uh, at LEAD, but um, also at her, um, obviously drawing from her work um, at uh, Civic Works, not Civic Works. Yes? I'm gonna get it wrong. Leadership uh, for Educational Equity and City are previous to City Year, thank you. And City Year <laughs> was part of a scale up grant, uh, uh, grant during the I3 rounds, um, an early scale up grant. So, anyway, um, can speak to, to some of that as well. All right, so we're going to start with a warm up. Um, we've got, uh, if we can go to the next slide, if you don't mind dropping the chat, we want to see what drew you to or is drawing you to this question of expanding visibility. So um, share share a strategy or an action that comes to mind, um, or feel free to break the rules and share a question. Just take thirty seconds and go in the chat. Love to hear from you. What's what are you most interested in um, getting out of this session? Sharing dissemination of results. Absolutely. Sharing findings, best practices. Expanding and so Linda, one of our panelists, sorry, I lost my chat for a minute. Linda, one of our panelists later around expanding and deepening their reach, our reach. Dissemination of impact. Oh, I love it, Melanie. Strategies to celebrate small wins along the way. We may not hit on that as much today, but um, there'll definitely be some pieces you can take away. Hey, Kate, um, increasing awareness across the sector, branding. Namrata may uh, want to unpack that word when we get there. Um, getting, getting the word out about our program. Yeah, making results relevant to more audiences, right? I, I love that one. I think that's dead on in terms of how we're thinking about this today. Um, potential models for partnering with others, other states, other cur um, huge curriculum. Mm, Melissa, moving beyond academic journals and conferences. So um, potentially thinking about, you know, who's the audience we're trying to target in terms of the, the message um, and movement. Communicating with rural audiences, yeah, where to share. Holy moly. All right, lots of good stuff. Love the small win focus, yep. Working with partners. Oh, I love this one. Working with LEA and SEA partners to support dissemination, right? So who are you, Mackinac? Who's communicating? Um, um, is a, who, who are the, who's the audience? Who's communicating? How are we getting there? Um, and, uh, and in what ways? Um, okay, thank you. So let's move um, to the next slide, please. And so today we're gonna do two things. One, delve into this question of effective messaging for key stakeholders. And again, it's a teaser and we'll, we'll do more of it with Namrata and the other team uh, in a month at the two hour workshop. And then we're gonna hear from some of your peers. And again, that's gonna feel pretty quick for on, on their end um, and sharing some of the lessons learned in implementation thus far under their EIR grants. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. And you can see the sense of timing here. Um, we're going to do some um, debriefing, pairing you up with uh, other grantees on the uh, workshop today or on the session today um, after we hear from Namrata and after we hear from your colleagues. Okay, next slide. All right, Namrata, I'm going to kick it over to you. Great, thank Welcome. you. Thanks so much. And it's lovely to be here. I really appreciate um, chatting with all of you. And based on what the the needs are of the various people in the audience you know I could do like four different directions for where this can go but as Tom mentioned this is a teaser so we're going to stay a little bit high level and I'll start with someone mentioned branding in the chat um, awareness and brand go hand in hand right like so if if you have solid brand and you have a solid positioning in your space you can build awareness off of that so I'll just start with a meta thing that to reflect on um, is who are you to your stakeholders or who are you to your target audience? And that is a question you should be consistently asking yourself um, as an organization, as an entity, as a, and then going to a specific piece of content that you want to disseminate, how does that fit into who you are uh, to, to your stakeholders, right? So. Um, with leaders of educational equity, who we are, we're a civic leadership development program. So we 
mentor and uh, offer curriculum and education to people who want to engage civically in their communities, whether it is through organizing, through policy and advocacy work, or through running for a local elected office. So having an understanding of who our stakeholders are then gives us this an idea of like what are what are their needs what do they need and how can they be leveraged to disseminate the information that you have or that you're trying to provide to get out there um this this uh, session is focused mostly on a single message that how to look at a, a message deconstruct it so that you can construct your own messages in the future um and if you go to the next slide there is um we create so much content on a daily basis so i'm sure you all you all are just drowning in information and trying to figure out like the wheat from the chafe if that's the proper analogy but what is more relevant and what is just nice to know and what is critical right so if we go into um i don't know if the slides are advancing but um if we can go to the next one yeah so we wanted i wanted to focus on like when we think about dissemination and yes all of the channel stuff is the how but what we're focusing on today is the what so seo the um, you know going beyond the reach of academia going to, uh, to a broader audience we can talk about that in the november session if if time and space but um that is the how part i wanted to focus a little bit on the what um, a lot of the things that I've seen over the years is there's so much great content and when it's specialized content, particularly in the spaces that we are in, it's very specialized. It, it almost requires a level of understanding as a way of entering into the space that how do you reach, how do you um, create, craft something that makes it sticky. So in marketing, sticky can be achieved in multiple ways. One of the ways is to just be super clear we don't always have to be like um, using an authoritative language to show the audience we know what we're talking about. And actually, there's a lot of research around um, you're actually smarter if you can simplify a complex thing, right? The other way to stickiness is really about um, the multiple times and the multiple ways you share that message. So um, when we think about audiences, fun fact, you have to you have to say something or an audience member has to see something eight times before they remember even 25% of it. And if we think about how we are in our day and how much information we're con consuming, what sticks, right? And what sticks throughout your day? Was it an interesting fun fact that now you know eight, it takes eight times? Or is it uh, something more complex than that? And if it's more complex, the more rep repetition and the multiple ways to show it is a, um, a way to get sticky about your message. So we have this really big thing, which I'm sure you've heard of, called critical race theory. It can be as complex as we can make it. For us, our goal is to how do we help our members talk about this in a politically charged environment. So when we think about, we could take multiple approaches. We can go deep into critical race theory. We can talk about origins. We can talk about a history. We can talk about systemic issues. We can talk about multiple layers and layers of things. So the first step is when you look at your piece of content you want to disseminate, you want to think about what, who are you disseminating to? And then what do you want them to take away from it? right? And that will determine the frame of your message. Um, and, you know, engagement is something like, that is a word that if I had a nickel for every time I heard it, right? <laughs> but it really between the sender and your audience, it's meaningless. Like that is a metric we use for performance management, more than a measure of something that that got through. So um, if we go to the next slide, What we really want to do is think about our audience and like what do what is what did we want our audience to take away? You know, the the <laughs> the biggest case study, and I, I hope someone does this case study or if they haven't already, which is how CDC uh handled the COVID dissemination, right? And because the findings were like constant and 
uh, and they had to reframe. And as more research came up, the more complex the virus got, the more complex the information got. But because it was a public, because it is a public health issue, what do you communicate that people can take away from? Do they need to understand mRNA or do they need to understand just wear a mask, right? So those are those are the two different choices you can make. It's not always binary, but you want to look at your your information and say, what is this critical thing? And no more than three, right? Like we we find a lot when we do research. We find a lot in, in the things that we want to disseminate. And because we're close to it, we want to say everything about that thing. But but it's really important for your audience to really understand it. No more than three critical things that you want them to take away. Um, the other part is, what do you need them to do after, right? Like, do you want them to tweet about it? That is a small ask. Do you want them to present it somewhere? Do you want them to uh, do a TED Talk on it? Do you want them to um, take it in and, and uh, diffuse it in their classroom? What is it the thing that you want? That has to be a question that is answered before you start crafting your message, right? And then the third is what is the most compelling part of the piece? So if you're presenting dry information, like this is how mRNA technology works, and some of us who are not science-minded, we're like, just tell me if it's going to fix the thing that I need fixed. Or um, is it, so is it more compelling to tell me as a person who digests stories to be like, okay, tell me, you know, <laughs> I'm going on a little bit tangent here, but if anybody remembers Schoolhouse Rock, like, tell me in that format how this complex thing works and I can understand how a bill becomes a law, right? So we want to think about the compelling parts of your information and how to leverage them to get your audience to do what they need you to do. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so a couple of things here, and um, this document is available as a link um, in your um, deck that you'll get is you tell them what you want them to do right in the message. You know, we want you to reframe the debate. That is a very clear way. And if you go to the next slide, um, you, you, um, you're using visual cues and you're using verbal cues to let them know this is what you have. This is how relevant this is for you. And here's what you can take away so you act very conversant in this information. So in this case, you know, we name our audience, we tell them what to do, and then you continue down. And we offer three different ways to approach this information. So you can either, if you're a direct person, you can come at it directly in the conversation. If you don't want to have a confrontation type mindset, here are some ways to talk about it that reframes the debate non-confrontationally. So you give them different ways and you give them words. So it's in some cases, if it's really complex, give your audience the language to use to speak about it, right? So um, if you peruse this document, there are sentences and phrases that we give to actually put the words in their mouth for them to become comfortable in speaking about it. So Again, you want to look at your audience and the complexity of your message and craft it in a way that is um, easily digestible and accessible to your audience. And, um, you know, I don't mean to make it seem like the audience can't grasp the information. I want us to like remember that we are audiences in many, many aspects of our lives. And how do we digest information, right? We can be. PhDs in anything and everything. Well, you can only be a PhD in a couple of things, but let's say you can be a PhD, but you still want to, you're, you're getting millions of pieces of information on a daily basis. If something sticks out, what about that thing sticks out? And we can dive deeper into this in the November session. Um, it can go in multiple ways, but if you go to the next slide, I think like this is just a, a teaser for how to develop messaging that really sticks. And it's really, 
Um, you could have been like TLDR, clap for, uh, you know, clap for clarity and comprehension. It's basically the takeaway from here. And then make sure you have your audience um, in mind. If you go to the next slide, I think that should be, I should be at time. Um, I do, if I have a minute, I would be, if I should say, um, to give meaning. So we live in a very contextual world. So we like comparisons, you know, this is like this, and that automatically creates meaning for us, right? So if I'm, uh, Tom mentioned, I'm an author, if I'm pitching a book, I'm going to be like, take two books and say, oh, this is Crazy Rich Asians meets The Martian, right? And like, I would read that book, by the way, but it you immediately create context for them. So when it comes to um, whatever piece of information you're trying to disseminate, the content you're trying to disseminate, how do you make it tangible for them by keep creating meaning? This is in the educational space, therefore it will do X, Y, and Z. Um, relatable, we always relate to each other as humans, so let's not forget that. Sometimes our, our language can be so cerebral that it dries it out and we are not necessarily um, responding to each other in a, a human way to say, hey, you know, if you have ever been in a first grade classroom and relate to that to them in from that level. Um, and then think about through lines. So every piece of communication has a beginning, middle, and end, right? And you want to, and this is that adage, maybe Dale Carnegie wrote it, who knows? I, I can't remember the source, but it wasn't me. You know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And again, that counts towards the stickiness, right? So make sure that you're looking at the through line and that you're look, creating a narrative arc. And then next slide. I, I just stole my own lead. <laughs> so that is, that's basically it. Make it as personal as possible. Um, I lean heavily into storytelling. If anybody's ever read anything by Walter Fisher and the narrative paradigm, you know, we all communicate through stories. Um, and if you think about the, the things that stick in your mind, they're more likely stories and experiences. And it's because as humans, that's how our brains are wired to process information. So um, think about what stories your audience can digest as part of the content that you're preparing and think about the stories that they can then tell to further disseminate your content, right? And next slide. Um, so this is the um, part of a toolkit that we've created. So one thing to remember is while each piece of content stands alone, it can be part of a library of content and communicating with a regular cadence in different ways for people to digest information. Some people are auditory. So do you have a podcast? Some people are visual. Do you have a video or a uh, some sort of visual element to it? Um, I'm a verbal processor. So uh, yeah, just give me pieces of paper to read and I will read it, right? So think you want to think about the depth and breadth of how your audience also consumes information and create um, this for that layer. Um, I will just leave you with one acronym and then I'll wrap up, which is COPE, the key to dissemination without to getting on into the burden of creating all of this content is create once, publish everywhere. You may think you have to create a new thing for each channel or a new thing, new piece of content around it for each type of stakeholder. That's not the case. If you craft it right, you can publish it everywhere and use it in multiple places. And the more times the audience sees the same information, the more likely it is sticky. So we may get sick of seeing it because we're so in the weeds of it, but your audience won't even remember the first three times that they saw it. So I will leave you with that. And I hope that's enough of a grounding for you to have some key takeaways today. And then uh, we can talk deeper into uh, this conversation, get deeper into this conversation in November. And I will turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you, Amanda. I'm thinking of my pod. I'm like, why do the same people keep advertising on the same podcast all the time? Like, oh yeah, that's because I only you, noticed the last Until time. you take action, Tom, they'll exactly. keep doing it. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, okay, I get it now. 
thank you. I'm excited for November. I'm excited to work with you and work with grantees. Um, and, then, and now I'm excited to hear from two of our grantees. Um, Linda is uh, the Director of Literacy and um, I believe the grant's called Reading Apprentice Program that has received the grant uh, Reading Apprenticeship, but Linda also um, in a prior uh, life uh, worked with the National Writing Project who also had received an I3 grant. And so she's quite familiar with this space. And then Teresa is in California. It's still morning there. Good morning, Teresa. And uh, we'll be sharing some work and lessons from, uh, from her project as well. So they'll share a, very briefly about the project itself and then delve into some of the lessons. Um, and probably we'll leave you wanting for more. So Linda, you're kicking us off. Great, thanks, Tom. If you'll move yeah. to the next slide, thanks. Um, so Reading Apprenticeship is a professional learning program for middle and high school teachers. Um, our grant is a mid-phase 2020 grant. Um, and we have been developing Reading Apprenticeship for over 25 years. And I was really inspired by um, uh, some of the things earlier in this session. So the message that we really hope people come away with is how reading apprenticeship can transform the relationships between teachers and students to use literacy to support their learning in content areas. And the action that we want people to take as we think about our dissemination is um, either to engage in reading apprenticeship professional learning for the first time, or if they're familiar with us, to um, keep deepening their work in the classroom to really make that deep difference for students. So I put together, um, along with my wonderful colleague, Mary Stump, who is the Associate Director of Reading Apprenticeship, um, a two-column chart. Mary leads a lot of our communications work. And so we really thought about, well, what works and what just has bombed um, in, in the past. And so we do think about a dissemination plan along the way. And um, rather than going into a really in-depth um, plan, and here we're talking more about some of the how, we keep a pretty simple spreadsheet um, or smart sheet to help us keep track of who we're reaching out to. Um, we really try to think about three different kinds of products as we think about some of our audiences and some of their um, needs. So one thing that we found to be really effective is to develop one page briefs and infographics that talk about our reach and our impact that are pretty quickly and easily um, grasped by a range of audience but especially are for um, some of the decision-making audiences. We also think a lot about the space of how we're contributing to the field and thinking both about um, teachers and leaders who might be taking up this work in their schools as well as academic researchers. And so there we do use longer form um, communications. We write and update some of our core books about our work um, based on what we learn through things. We um, collaboratively write journal articles and we lead conference sessions for a variety of audiences. And then finally, um, stories are really central in all of our work. And so we're looking at stories of students, teachers, and administrators doing real work in the form of short videos and web stories. And they often build on each other and repeat um, information. Um, this comes from a lot of experience of having many hundred plus page research uh, reports. If you went to our um, website, you would be able to find some of those. That creates the raw material for creating our messages um, in more digestible ways. We also think about opportunities to invite um, our stakeholders and prospective partners um, into the work and to see living, breathing um, things in action. Um, and all of those communications tools helps draw people to this kind of event. So our colleague Sharon Saez really helped us think about um, a structure called a learning tour. And we work with some of 
our longstanding reading apprenticeship schools um, to craft an opportunity for a pretty small group of educators to come together and see reading apprenticeship um, in action so that they can really see what does this look like in a beginning implementation classroom? What does it look like um, in a mature classroom? What are, to talk with administrators about what are some of the successes and pitfalls? And finally, this leads us back to um, the action that we hope our audiences will take, which is to engage with us through in-depth professional learning. And we've really found that our grant-funded work um, allows us to uh, continuously improve our uh, professional learning and sometimes it affords us more resources than our school and district partners would have on their own. So we really think about our professional learning and how to um, create that uh, those opportunities that can fit within the constraints of um, school and district time and budget allocations. So we really emphasize um, thinking about what is it that we want our audience to, to understand, what's the message, and then how do we get them to engage with us in um, deep and sustained ways over time so that we can really see the impacts that we hope for for um, teachers and students. And just a couple of other things that have not worked so well for us, and I'd be really curious if they have worked for others, we have not found large dissemination events or interactive digital spaces um, that don't have clear and ongoing reasons for people to visit to be a really great use of our investment time. So thank you, and it's really great to be part of this session. Thank you, Linda. The, um, before we jump to Teresa, the learning tour structures, are those in person or are they videotaped or is it, can you just say? In a they're, they're in person. So in person. we have um, a team who will go and really go to a couple of sites, see how implementation is, find out, um, you know, what availability they have. And then uh, we work with school sites to structure a day where people have a chance to talk with administrators, teachers, visit classrooms, see how that maps on to um, our model for um, literacy learning in the disciplines. Awesome, thank you. All right, Teresa, let's go to, to you. If we can go to the next slide, please. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Fowler. I'm a, the Grant Administrator for Riverside County Office of Education. And um, we are the last of the I-3. We are 2017 I-3 development grant. Um, and our project is called Mathematical Reasoning with Connections. So it's a 12th year math course um, in California, only two years of math is required for graduation. However, our UC and Cal States, our four year universities require at least three years of math. So um, part of our, the goal of our project was to keep students engaged and encourage them to continue to take math through their senior year so they're not limited once they get to senior year and realize, oh, I should have taken another year or two of math. And then now they're kind of forced in the community college track. Um, so our project, like I said, we're just finishing it up. Uh, we just had our last few trainings last week and we have served, our project is in the Inland Empire area, which is Riverside and San Bernardino counties. So that geographic area is larger than the six smallest states. It's a pretty wide, diverse area <laughs> um, of what we serve. But um, part of our project is it's 20 days of professional development. So we do 10 days during the summer, you know, five days and five days. And then we have 10 days during the school year while the teachers are actually implementing. And so that's been beneficial because since it is a new curriculum, there is professional development that, you know, the teachers can ask questions and, you know, get together with their groups as you know, they're teaching it with their students as things have come up. So rather than some other programs or curriculum where here's a training, kind of good luck, implement it. We're there, you know, throughout the entire process. Part of the feedback we got um, even after the first, the first two years of the 20 days of training, teachers were asking for more. So we received some other funding for a second year and beyond. 
And we actually held one of those trainings last week. And we had some teachers come that, you know, went through the project originally from 2017 that have been teaching it and still came back. So, I mean, that's one of the things is, especially for math, uh, professional learning. I mean, we have teachers that are begging us to do more. Um, so that's definitely encouraging. Uh, some of the stuff that we learned with our project is obviously, I mean, it's probably going to sound really basic, but communication is key. So the first, you know, year or two, it was one of those teachers didn't really completely understand what's expected of them. Principals didn't understand, counselors didn't understand. So we developed basically a document, I think we called it an MOU, but it's basically non-binding, but basically all the roles and responsibilities. What's the roles of the teacher? What's the role of the counselor who are placing these students in the course? Um, since our course was new, a lot of the counselors placed a lot of the students that shouldn't have been in there, the lower level students, but um, our data actually, our students outperformed our comparison, the pre-calculus students that are, you know, theoretically higher I don't say higher level, but, you know, according to the test scores, they are higher. So, and part of that, um, the feedback that we got from the students and teachers is because of the way the course is taught. It's not a typical, you know, here's one answer and that's it. It's the teacher is really teaching and engaging the students and there are multiple ways to find the solution. And, you know, the professional learning is teaching our, our, uh, our presenters are college professors and also K-12 teachers that have gone through a uh, train the trainer program. So they're showing the teachers that we're training, like it's okay to, you know, have this productive struggle and, you know, to fail and to find other ways. So that's one of the things that the teachers and the, especially the students have really given us good feedback. Um, each year, starting with the second year, we started to do student interviews to get their feedback and how to ways to modify and improve the project and the students, a lot of the feedback was, why is it that, you know, my 12th grade year, now I'm learning how to do math this way. Now I actually like math. I mean, a lot of the students are like, I'm taking this course because my counselor says I have to. I hated math, but now I actually am thinking about going into STEM or the math field. So just like that whole change of mindset has definitely been amazing to be a part of. Um, so, Let's see. I mean, I have on here, Tom asked for kind of tips, what's worked, what hasn't. Probably the biggest things is communication, um, getting the buy-in. So really finding like what, what is needed, like what is like our focus was what, what can we do to help our students succeed? What can we do to help our teachers succeed? And so when the students and the teachers see the benefit of the project, they become the ones who are going to sell the project for you. I mean, our teachers were selling kind of the project to other teachers. We had teachers emailing us, hey, we want to be in the next cohort. We had districts emailing us, they want to be part of it. You know, students are making like their own little videos. They're reaching out to students, hey, this is a really great class. You should take it. It's, you know, so just really figuring that out and really getting people to see the value of it. Um, and then, like I said, the student teacher voice and that impact has been really big. And then kind of like what Linda had touched on, just some, have the documents there. Um, you know, we did like an FAQ document, the roles and responsibilities. So we're creating all that different stuff the first couple of years and obviously modifying it throughout the project as things come up. But so you do have that consistent voice with the different, all the different districts that we're working with. You know, of course, each district is different. Administration is a little bit different. We also had at the beginning, the first day, the kickoff, we would, the teachers would come, the counselors, a school administrator, we would try to get a district administrator, and we would share about the project. Um, starting year two and three, we had basically like a, a panel of, you know, prior participants and what the benefit was. So they could hear from their peers, you know, a principal can hear from another principal the benefit that it's had, you know, in their school. And then as far as sustainability, we were able to um, our class get into the master calendar. So some of our districts actually switched from their pre-calculus courses to our course. And so they're not teaching pre-calculus anymore, they're teaching MRWC. So even though our grant funded has, our grant funding will have ended, they're still continuing the course. And then our county office and our partner, San Bernardino County office, we're still providing support to those teachers um, you know, that are gonna be teaching. 
we'll probably be doing like a fee for service for anyone else that wants to continue to get trained, you know, in the future. But uh, that's, you know, that's something that has worked well. And then, I mean, really just, again, the communication, we have, you know, everything's in a Google Drive, we have, you know, Google Classroom, all the different documents. We have um, the different groups of teachers can talk to, you know, with each other. We have ones from, you know, 2017, 18, they've been teaching a couple of years, you know, what's worked to help those, you know, newer teachers. So that's all. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I didn't know the sustainability part. That's really cool and kind of crazy that pre, you know, some folks are switching from pre-calc to this course. My, if we have more time, which we don't, I then want to know what impact is that having down the road on, you know, ninth and tenth grade math, which you alluded to, uh, at least some student experiences um, and uh, of it being different in terms of how math is taught. Yeah, oh, real, real quick. So I don't know if I mentioned, but we are seeking funding to actually push this down to eleventh grade. Um, because based on you know the student comments, and then we're actually trying to push it all the way down to ninth grade. Um, so we have our you know some of our team is developing different activities and uh, materials. It won't be probably a full curriculum like what we have right now, but um, that's one of the questions that we do. We would ask the teachers, you know, what's the impact been? You know, have you have you seen an impact on your other courses that they're teaching? And all the teachers have said, yes, I've started to implement in this in my ninth grade math class, my 10th grade, yeah. 11th grade. So even though it's not technically like the 12th grade course, it's still being implemented in other parts, you know, within the school. So that's exciting to see. That is exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing some lessons learned and um, yeah, appreciate your time. Uh, all right, let's go to the next slide and we're gonna give you all some time to debrief. We've thrown a lot at you. We want to give you some time to unpack it. And I think Helen is gonna put up, oh, there it is, um, in the chat, a link to the Padlet. And then we're gonna put you in breakouts of um, three to four people. And so that will happen momentarily. Um, and you're gonna have, I'm pausing for a minute. You're gonna have, uh, um, you're going to have about eight minutes to uh, just um, decompress and think about two uh, questions. And the two questions are on the Padlet. And they are, what messaging strategies have worked for you? And then how are you leveraging that, that kind of messaging to support scaling up and sustainability? And if you want to talk about something else related to anything you've heard, feel free to do that too, because um, I, I know we threw a lot at you. Um, Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had some good conversations in uh, in your breakouts. And I saw um, on the uh, on the Padlet that there were uh, a lot of comments and messages around the kind of what has worked um, video and some we got some thumbs up videos, leveraging reputation. Uh, the kind of communicating through familiar and trusted faces and people, uh, figuring out how to connect, yeah, connect with folks that they care about or what they care about, conference presentations. Uh, yeah, you know, kind of building in and then sustainability of the comment here around scaling up and sustainability is building into some of the, essentially the infrastructure in a district or in a school, right? But thinking about what, how do you, where do you install some of this work so that it continues? past the life of a grant. <laughs> um, I wonder if there are any, um, Namrata, I don't know if, as you read through, if there are any any pieces you wanna highlight and comment on, and then um, and I'll see if any of the groups wanna, wanna share a tidbit or two as well. You know, I was just working my way through the comments and still sort of digesting all of that, but yeah. good solid information in the, in the area. I'm, not necessarily seeing a lot of questions in there, more around yeah. um, yeah, and, reputation yeah. is a really um, good one in terms of like making sure that establishing authority for what you're bringing to the table and making sure you're consistent. That's how you build reputation. Is like mm -hmm. consistency is really key in there. Yeah, any any of the breakout groups um, want to highlight uh, particular pieces you spoke about? 
and or Linda or Teresa, any comments? I, I think you were maybe in some of the breakouts as well. Did you have any reflections from yours? I can I can jump in. We were talking a lot about evaluation findings um, mm -hmm. and talking about strategies for sharing those that's more than the 100 plus page report and really thinking about um, using some data visualization and research briefs that um, summarize the key findings that is accessible to a pretty broad audience. People who want the technical detail can always go to the technical report or the journal article for more, um, but that that can be a really effective way of communicating um, what was learned in addition to stories. We were also doing some troubleshooting around recruitment in this particularly challenging time uh, for getting um, schools and teachers on board with projects. Yeah, we have also shared, I mean, I know it's in there, but we've also shared at conferences, also, you know, instructional leader networks, you know, things like that. Um, you know, we have a page on our website that we share, you know, the other county offices share, you know, things like that. So just, again, kind of getting the word out, the different districts, some of them have, you know, information on their, you know, their website, their different, you know, math chairs. We've shared different, a couple different math conferences locally, um, an evaluation conference. We work really closely with our external evaluator. So sharing the results, you know, a different, a different avenue through more of like the evaluation community rather than, you know, the math or the project community. So that's a different way too that we've done. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I think we can, we're going to go to the next slide, which is, um, so some of you, many of you, I think, but um, some of you are sure have joined our um, past sessions. So we're on module four coming out November 15th and the um, registration information is on the next page. You received an email last week about it as well. You will be receiving it maybe, I, I'm sure a reminder, um, but, but if you look at the, this is the series of workshops that, that uh, Brian LeCander referenced at the beginning, um, but we started last, or, or kind of started this series in March um, and, and have taken some steps now to, to um, through, kind of what does it mean to scale and sustain up this work? What's the knowledge base that we can learn from, from my three grantees, from existing EIR grantees? Um, what strategies uh, kind of come to bear in, in looking at, um, uh, essentially the path along, you know, everyone's taking a different path to scaling sustainability and everyone's answer to scaling sustainability are different um, in terms of what success looks like. Uh, and then this, this uh, fourth module is going to be really delving into what, what role, what is that role of stakeholder engagement, dissemination, marketing, um, and supporting scaling up and sustainability. So it'll be a two hour work workshop. We tend to break these workshops into two pieces. So I, Think we're going to, you know, as the, the subtitle implies, we're going to spend a chunk of time on stakeholder engagement and then a chunk of time on the, the kind of more dissemination marketing messaging aspect. Um, and the workshops include both some, uh, I guess you could say, direct, direct instruction, case study work, and then also some uh, roll up rest sleeves and work together um, and learn from each other pieces as well. So we'd be excited to have you. Um, and if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out. And then coming up uh, on January 31st and March 28th, we'll have um, the all important kind of budget and business model um, discussion um, at the end of January. And then uh, at the end of March, uh, looking uh, a little bit further down around conditions, scaling options and um, uh, open licensing, a number of, um, approaches, I guess you could say, to, to uh, scaling and sustaining as well. So I hope you can join us. Um, and on the next slide, you can't click on it right now, but um, I think can put, um, can drop the link in to register for the uh, workshop number four. And um, and then the second link is gonna be a link for, to join the, um, our, the scaling up and sustainability community of practice. So you get, more communication, should be invited to the COP meetings. We use the COP meetings to go deeper. So we have workshop number four on November 15th. 
um, you have the opportunity to either do some work or reflect. Um, and, um, and then we'll go a little bit deeper on December 13th at the COP. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to do that from module five and module six um, and connecting the two. And then lastly, actually there's two more slides it looks like, or no, one more. Lastly, we just have the references to, let me go to, yeah, right here, um, to the toolkit um, that Namrata shared and, and referenced earlier. Um, you can access all of the recordings from our past workshops and um, notes from the COPs through NAC. And there's a generic username and password you need to get to access to that. It's very easy and simple. Uh, you know how to get in touch with Ed and then you know how to get in touch with us. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I want to thank Namrata, Linda, and Teresa for all the prep and time um, and thought put into the, the session today. And we look forward to um, hearing from you and partnering with you going forward. Thank you.